Tonight on Talking Points, students marched in cities across the country and even around the world for gun legislation. We'll see how those protests were received. A new policy is being pushed to stop drug traffickers. Critics say it may be too extreme. We'll have the full details on that move. And one of France's most controversial presidents in recent times finds himself a new investigation. All that and more ahead. This is Talking Points. One hundred and fifty diplomats have been expelled by Russia today. The move comes in retaliation for the United States, the United Kingdom and other countries expelling Russian diplomats. Good evening, I'm Mike Riccardi. And I'm Josh Carney. In addition to the diplomats leaving, Russia is also closing its consulate in St. Petersburg. Sixty American diplomats will be expelled from Russia, the same amount of staff that Washington is expelling from the United States. The aggressive move comes after recent revelations show that the Kremlin may have been involved in poisoning a Russian spy in the United Kingdom. Furthermore, Western countries, including the U.S., have placed sanctions on Russia following aggressive actions in Crimea and Syria. The U.S. State Department called today's expulsion regrettable and unwarranted. Furthermore, Russia will close down the U.S. consulate in St. Petersburg. Ambassador John Huntsman Jr. was summoned to the foreign ministry where he was informed of Russia's decision. Huntsman says that further action against Russian assets may be taken. The other active U.S. consulate in Vladivostok will remain unaffected. So there's a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discrepancies, and this is duking it out between these two global powers. But ultimately, where this goes will kind of dictate terms on the international scale. Well, what I find interesting, right, is when we look at the long-term relationship between President Trump and Russia. If you mm -hmm. go back to when Congress passed the sanctions against Russia, President Trump was hesitant to sign them. They yeah. were only enforced, imposed two weeks ago, which is weeks right. after the deadline. Then you go to the you go to the call when President Trump congratulated Vladimir Putin. He didn't condemn him for this attack. Mm -hmm. Attack, but you've seen over these last few weeks is slowly ratcheting it up. And I think this is the highest tensions have been in a very long time. It's certainly the highest tensions have been, but the results that are coming from those tensions are kind of you know all over the place. You don't really have a strong line stance from the U.S. compounded by the fact that Russians are you know, technically abusing such powers provides for a kind of weary territory when you look at it in mass. So it could be going one way and it could be going the other, but we'll have to, you know, see what unfolds. Absolutely. In the past week, students all across the nation marched to support in support of gun control. The march has made national and international news, and many protesters have gained the attention of national and state legislatures. Here to talk about the protests and what they mean for a new generation of activists are Talking Points analysts Michael Fernari and Brandon Ross. Guys, thank you for being here. My pleasure. So aside from scale, how is this march different from others? And not only other, you know, related to gun march, but other issues of tragedy. Well, in light of the Parkland shooting last month, uh, we saw the Parkland uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School students organize a march in D.C. And this was a massive march. It was about 200,000 people, and a lot of them were actually not young people. I believe st studies showed only about 10% of the population there was of millennial voting age. And, you know, you mentioned in that question what's different about these marches. And one thing that I think is important to emphasize is that this march made a big made voter turnout a big part of their message and they mm -hmm. were very much encouraging young people to go out and vote in the 2018 midterms you know inspired by the events in Parkland well do you think we should be expecting any sort of tangible change obviously this is something very different from what we've seen after past mass shootings but obviously they're going to continue to happen well the thing that I think needs to be looked out for with regards to these protests, and I think history shows this, is that the more specific the protesters get with their messaging and the more specific they are with potential solutions, the more success they're going to have. Now, if you were to look at a movement like Occupy Wall Street that did not have specific solutions, they accomplished very little. And if, Parkland, if the Parkland students can find specific solutions, I think they can have some success. And if people expect really the young population, 18 to 29, to really take over the midterm voting, they should really damper their expectations. Historically, very rarely does the voting on 18 to 29 ever exceed over 20%. 2006 was the last big Democratic wave election. Millennials turned out, uh, rather 18 to 29, at a rate of about 23.5%, certainly well below 
many other age groups. Well, for piggybacking on kind of the Democratic push and then also looking at the specificity of the remarks, you see gun control as a major focus point in this debate, and they're encouraging people to go out and vote. So if the Democrats ultimately attach gun control as a major priority in the 2018 midterms, how would that affect, you know, a, a, a wave of voters coming in? Well, Josh, I think the Democrats need to be very careful with their messaging going forward. Now, in this week, news came out that the generic poll has re the advantage for the Democrats reduced from about 15 to only about six points right now. Mm -hmm. And going forward, looking at these elections, one of the core issues is that Republicans don't have a reason to turn out. Now, if Republican voters feel that their Second Amendment rights are going to be jeopardized, it gives them a reason to go to the polls in droves, and that's something the Democrats should be very afraid of. And let's not forget the, the last time a midterm election succeeded a major push for gun control legislation back in 2014. Republicans picked up nine Senate seats and increased their lead in the House from 33 seats to 59 in just one election. And when you look right, like, you, like we've been speaking here, the repercussions for 2018, there were certain factions of, of America that were highly critical of this march, and you've seen them go as far as to criticize Emma Gonzalez for, for supporting her, her uh, ethnicity of being Cuban. You actually had pictures of her that were doctored to show her ripping up the Constitution instead of a target practice. Obviously, those have been condemned by many people. Rick Santorum did it with Chris Cuomo the other day. He condemned it. But my, my question is, do you think there's going to be repercussions on the other side of the aisle for that sort of backlash? Well, I think that, again, Democrats should maybe be a little bit wary as NRA donations have tripled over the last month. And I think that what we're seeing is all it's really doing is ramping up the intensity on both sides. And that we're not really finding a middle ground here. All people seem to be doing is finding more reasons to justify their own previous stances. And, and something that I've always found interesting is the paradox, and we saw it, when Hillary Clinton looked like she might win, gun sales went through the roof. Ever since President Trump has been in office, they have subdued because there is that fear that no longer will their guns be taken away. So I think that is also something to watch. Certainly a contentious theme and something that is definitely going to be we'll, a major theme in 2018. We'll leave the conversation we'll there. there. Brandon, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And after the break, we'll look at the effects that those marches had in state legislation, as well as a solution to drug trafficking that's igniting controversy. Stay with us. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice, single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers, but you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Here's your check. You, you got it. You know, since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. No, no, no. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Following last month's Parkland shoot, school shooting in Florida, citizens took to the streets in several major U.S. cities to advocate for stricter gun laws, including here in Syracuse. Multiple states are trying to achieve more gun restrictions, as the Florida state legislature is trying to ban bump stocks. And more recently, the Vermont State House passed a bill that would put in place several gun restrictions. Here to break down what this all means is Talking Points contributor Jack Watson. Jack, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Now, can you just break down the specifics of what exactly this gun legislation looks like in the Vermont House. So the Vermont House is trying to do a number of things. First of all, they're trying to uh, increase the minimum age to purchase a firearm to 21. They're trying to ban uh, bump stocks, which uh, the bump stock attachment was most famously used, or infamously rather, used uh, in the Las Vegas shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing they're trying to do is to limit the capacity of ammunition, limit the capacity of 
uh, the amount of rounds that you can put into a weapon. Now let's explain from both sides what, bo what both of those things mean. Um, in conservative circles, people have been disputing the uh, raising the minimum age to 21 because they argue, look, if you can join the military at age 18 and you can carry a weapon into war uh, for the United States, then you should be able to own a gun. This is what conservative people... Many make the same argument with alcohol. Right, right. And uh, the same argument you're seeing in a lot of conservative circles. And uh, when it comes to the bump stock argument, um, a lot of people wanted that, in, in liberal circles, wanted that banned because, uh, of course, of the Las Vegas shooting uh, and the fact that um, it can mimic the effect of a fully automatic weapon. Um, of course, a semi-automatic weapon, if you pull the trigger once, one bullet comes out. This modification would make it so that more bullets would come out uh, after you pull the trigger, uh, mimicking a fully automatic weapon. Fully automatic weapons are actually, uh, for the most part, uh, illegal in the United States uh, as part of the National Firearms Act of 1934 and a couple amendments to it in the 1980s. So, um, and with several more gun legislation bills being passed in this in these individual states, uh, they're certainly trying to minimize the effect. And when we put the focus on those states, this latest tragedy obviously happened in Florida. So let's pivot to Florida's gun legislation that they're trying to pass. What exactly are they trying to accomplish? Well, a couple of weeks ago, the governor Rick Scott signed a bill uh, that did a lot of what the Vermont state. Uh, House was trying to accomplish. It raised the minimum gun buying age to 21. Um, it banned bump stocks. Uh, but, but an interesting thing that that bill did was it provided funding for uh, some programs related to teachers, which Governor Rick Scott says um, he would rather keep uh, locally the decision whether teachers should be armed. And as of, and this program would require uh, not just everyday teachers, but specific teachers who have had training in this, uh, get 144 hours in training. Uh, by training, I mean uh, military background, they would get 144 hours in, of training, plus uh, uh, officials and police officers in the schools would be allowed to carry these weapons. Uh, but that's, of course, going to be decided locally in Florida. And Jack, President Trump has certainly been no stranger to letting his opinions be known. What has it looked like in this case? Well, federally, a lot, uh, a lot hasn't really been done about gun control, but the president has actually tweeted out that uh, he wants to ban bump stocks, which were, of course, um, well, the, he, which he accuses the Obama administration of uh, legalizing in, in effect, which is mostly true according to PolitiFact. But, um, what uh, the concern is here, regardless of whether you lean conservative or you lean liberal or you're in the middle, is the fact that uh, if the president can unilaterally enact gun legislation by executive order, which is what he suggested doing in a number of meetings, mm -hmm. uh, and of course in a meeting earlier he said that he wanted to skip due process, take guns away from people, and then have due process, is alarming to a lot of people because it's giving the executive branch a lot more power than you know, you basically came into the Trump administration with. The, and the executive order concern has been a concern for a long time, including in the Obama and the Bush administrations. All right, Jack Watson, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And last Wednesday, Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued a memo to federal prosecutors instructing them to pursue the death penalty in cases of large amounts of drug trafficking. The move comes after President Trump said that not executing drug dealers was a waste of time. Here to break down what this policy means is Talking Points analyst Sabrina Majore. Sabrina? A recent memo issued by Attorney General Jeff Sessions encourages federal prosecutors to seek the death penalty in some cases of drug trafficking. This directive comes after a speech by President Trump that outlined plans to combat the opioid epidemic and suggested that the Justice Department pursue this stance. Under federal law, capital punishment is allowed for drug trafficking cases that involve murder or homicide. But Attorney General Sessions has pointed to one provision that allows for the death penalty when extremely large quantities of drugs are involved. According to the Washington Post, no one has ever been tried under this provision. Some legal scholars say a case using this provision would likely face trouble if it were appealed to the Supreme Court. Historically, the Supreme Court has refused to sanction the use of the death penalty in any crimes other than homicide. A relatively recent example, in 2008, the Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty was unconstitutional in a case where someone raped but did not kill a child. Also, federal executions in the U.S. are extremely rare to begin with. Since the death penalty was reinstated in 1988, only three federal inmates have been put to death. But Sessions believes this more aggressive legal policy is necessary. According to Sessions, drug overdoses killed more than 64,000 Americans in 2016. Overdoses now rank as the leading cause of death among Americans under 50. To combat this, the memo suggests federal prosecutors consider, quote, every lawful tool at their disposal. It also proposes appointing an opioid coordinator to every U.S. district. Sessions' directive did not come without criticism. Some say that the policy would disproportionately affect people of color. 
Critics point to data which explains that African Americans are overrepresented in execution chambers throughout the U.S. While African Americans make up only 12% of the population, 34% of those executed since the 1970s have been African American. Additionally, some legislators say that the proposal would hit those who cannot afford to defend themselves the hardest. Thanks, Sabrina. After the break, France's ex-president finds himself dealing with a new investigation. Stay tuned to see how developments from Europe. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Earlier this week, Recreations Commissioner Lazarus Sims on administrative leave. This follows a report from City Auditor Marty Masterpole that found financial discrepancies in the Parks Department, leading to an investigation from the District Attorney's Office. Here to help piece together how this all began and what comes next is Talking Points Analyst Connor White. Connor, thank you for being here. Thank you. So, as I understand it, a city council person set this all in motion, correct? Yes, this all started when um, Common Councilor Suzanne Boyle received a tip from a constituent that something was off within the Parks Department. So, uh, she initially took this to Walsh's transition team after he won the election for mayor. Mm -hmm. She wasn't satisfied with the way that the team handled it. They rehired Sims, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so, she then went on to talk to City Auditor Marty Masterpole. He investigated it through a city audit of the department, and what he fa he found several financial discrepancies, some irregularities mm -hmm. uh, that, to him, raised enough alarm bells to take it to the district attorney. And you mentioned the discrepancy within that transition, and how exactly did Walsh's team handle it outside of just simply rehiring? Well, what they said was when they took a look at it, they they decided they didn't they didn't really have enough hard evidence at the time to be able to do anything about Sims. Mm -hmm. They wanted to rehire him and sort of see how things went. Uh, in a statement from the uh, Director of City Initiatives, they said that given the limitations of not yet being in office, our review was inconclusive. Rather than act with incomplete information, we decided it was better to take time to assess the Commissioner's performance after taking office. So they were going on the idea that in the transition phase, they didn't really have enough authority to dive into what had gone wrong, so they decided to make it more of a trial basis. And in terms of diving into what that went wrong, do we know anything that actually was found yet? We don't know specifically. Um, the DA has looked to uh, can anyone who's in the know mm -hmm. on this to make any statements public as they're afraid that it could uh, meddle with their investigation. And it's saying, well, the, the district attorney's office is saying that there are already laws that have been broken because you have breached the fact that the public has not been able to have this information. So what is that kind of based on? Right, so on Monday, Marty Masterpool had a meeting with uh, city common councilors, and there they discussed some, he was briefing them on to, as to what he found within the audit. Before they could release that to the public, the DA said, stop, we don't want this going out. Now, what a watchdog committee has brought up is the uh, something called the uh, open meeting law, which is a New York state law, which says that without um, an executive session being called, which was not called in this case, uh, you cannot have a meeting between public officials on private information that is not, not then made public. Mm -hmm. And what can we expect next coming out of that for this investigation? Well, we're not quite sure what comes next for now. The uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Parks Department, uh, she's handling day-to-day uh, -day 
uh, responsibilities while the deputy mayor has taken over as the interim commissioner. And we'll sort of just have to see. The DA has said that their investigation should be wrapped up relatively soon, so it's just the waiting game at this point. Thanks for looking into it, and we'll certainly keep our eye on it. Thank you. France's ex-president Nicolas Sarkozy has been ordered to stand trial yet again. Sarkozy is accused of illegally contacting a judge involved in an earlier investigation. Mike Riccardi will explain how Sarkozy found himself in this situation. Another blow dealt to Nicolas Sarkozy earlier today as the former French president was ordered to stand trial for charges of corruption. The incident in question surrounds alleged contact between Sarkozy and a senior French judge, Gilbert Azebert. Both Azebert and Sarkozy's lawyer Thierry Herzog, who allegedly set up contact between Sarkozy and Azebert, have also been ordered to stand trial. The corruption claims stem from a phone call in 2014, two years after Sarkozy left office. In the call, which was wiretapped by French police, Sarkozy allegedly offered Azebert a prominent job in Monaco in exchange for information on a then ongoing investigation into illegal financing of Sarkozy's 2007 campaign. Sarkozy was cleared in the 2007 investigation, but the questions into the phone call still remain. According to Sarkozy's team, the former president will appeal the decision, even though objections to the legality surrounding the wiretap were rejected. Furthermore, Sarkozy has denied any wrongdoing, but this is only the latest of several investigations into the former president. Last year, Sarkozy was ordered to stand trial for corruption charges surrounding his unsuccessful 2012 re-election campaign. Those charges handed down to Sarkozy and 13 others are based on illegal financing of the campaign. The case is ongoing as Sarkozy's appeal to stand trial is still pending. In perhaps the most surprising allegation, the former president has been accused of taking millions in illegal campaign funds from then Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. A formal investigation into this matter begun last week. The claims that Sarkozy accepted the funds for a successful 2007 campaign have plagued the politician for nearly five years. Like the rest, Sarkozy denies these allegations. The Frenchman claims that the Libyan accusers are seeking revenge for his decision to intervene in the 2011 Libyan civil war. Between this, on, uh, this ongoing investigation, the order to stand trial, and the hearing of his appeal, Sarkozy says he's being unfairly accused for political reasons. Following his unsuccessful re-election bid in 2012, Sarkozy did not give up, running again for his party's nomination in 2016. The center-right Republicans went another direction, and ever since, Sarkozy has tried to stay out of the political realm. Clearly, Josh, his wishes are not being met. And after the break, we'll take a look at some stories you may have missed. Don't go away. Did you hear about the pony with a sore throat? He was a little horse. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why couldn't the pelican? Wait. Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because the players kept dribbling all over it. Where did cats go on vacation? New York. <laughs> This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the way I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Some stories don't receive the mainstream attention that they deserve. Here are a few you may have missed. A faction of the Boko Haram military group has released almost all of the young schoolgirls that were kidnapped last month. The military group known as Islamic State's West Africa Province raided a secondary school for girls in Dapchi, Nigeria and kidnapped 110 students. At least five of the girls were killed while in the custody of the Boko Haram faction and one Christian girl is still being held captive for refusing to give up her religion. 
The returned girls were warned to not continue their education and threatened to kidnap them again if they did. A father of one of the kidnapped girls stated that the girls will not return to school unless the security is improved. The Nigerian information minister stated that the Nigerian government is currently in talks with Boko Haram over a potential ceasefire. This marks the first time that the government has made public ceasefire talks with the military group. And Jose Yunez, a Brazilian lawyer and close ally of President Michel Temer, was arrested today by police in graft probe investigations. Yunez has been accused of allegedly awarding concessions at Brazil's busiest container port. His arrest comes as part of a federal police operation with the arrest of five other significant figures, all of which have ties to President, Brazil's president. However, the president himself denies any misconduct as he's currently being investigated. Yunez was President Tamir's special advisor until December of 2016 when he resigned amid corruption accusations. For years, Brazil has experienced a huge corruption scandal which has landed top politicians and businessmen in jail. President Tamir's predecessor, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, may be jailed next week after being sentenced to 12 years on corruption charges. After the break, Mike and I will break down a story that we're looking ahead to. Don't go away. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. President Trump's son-in-law and White House aide Jared Kushner is alleged of leaking classified information to Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Multiple sources claim that Kushner had discussed Saudi leaders who were disloyal to the Crown Prince in a meeting last year. Kushner is tasked with leading negotiations throughout the Middle East and has maintained a close relationship with Saudi Arabia's leader. However, House Democrats are now calling for the FBI to investigate Kushner's ties to the Crown Prince. I'll be looking ahead to how the White House manages this situation and what it means for Kushner's relationship with the administration moving forward. So looking beyond this and also looking in the context of this week, there have been multiple allegations about, you know, sort of frosty relationships when it comes to Trump team members and foreign diplomats. And just before we came on air today, Rick Gates was uh, asked by the special counsel to, um, you know, give information mm -hmm. on the, uh, the Trump team as well. So we're looking at lots of conflicts throughout the administration, focusing on national security, focusing on the, you know, Russian investigation that is ongoing, and lots of unanswered questions. Kushner was tasked with so much, but has delivered very little. So ultimately, how Trump kind of maneuvers past this one will be difficult to see. Yeah, Josh, like you said, breaking news right before we came on air tonight that the special counsel, Robert Mueller, did ask Rick Gates to cooperate and hand over some information. But what I find interesting about Jared Kushner is that the president, I feel, may take this a little bit more personally than his close allies because this is, after all, his son-in-law, yeah. one of his closest trusted advisors. Not someone that he can brush off and also somebody that he's put a tremendous amount of pressure on in terms of his administration's success. Not to mention, many have been calling for a special counsel to investigate the special counsel. The DOJ right. has said no on that one. We'll have to leave it there, though. And that's all we have for Talking Points tonight. I'm Mike Riccardi. And I'm Josh Carney. Follow Citrus TV News on Facebook and Twitter and more content. And check out CitrusTV.com slash Talking Points for all our websites and articles. And don't forget to tune in next Thursday for a brand new episode of Talking Points. Have a good night, sir.